sponsored in part by Green Mountain Support Services, empowering neighbors with disabilities to be at home in the community. Additional support for Abled and On Air is sponsored in part by Washington County Mental Health Services, where hope and support come together. Welcome to this edition of Abled and On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Arlene is off today. On this program today, we focus on etiquette and journalism and the importance of etiquette and journalism, um, do's and don'ts. Uh, with us to discuss this important topic is Christine Gilger, Dean of um, Walter Cronkite School of Journalism, part of the Arizona State University School of Journalism. Welcome to Able Dinner Air, Kristen. Thanks. It's, a, it's Associate Dean, but... Uh, Associate Dean. I apologize. <laughs> okay. Thank you uh, so much. Um, so can you tell me the missions and goals of the, uh, of the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and the importance of um, the National Center for Disabilities and Journalism? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to talk about it. So the National Center on Disability and Journalism, or as we refer to it, the NCDJ, um, has been um, uh, located at the Cronkite School here at ASU for about 10 years now. And it started out, you know, just very small, a uh, group of volunteers, a graduate assistant, and me. Um, and uh, we have built it up, I think, pretty substantially over the last decade to the point now where we're doing a lot of training um, around the country for journalists and communicators of all kinds on, you know, how to be, how to make some difficult choices sometimes in terms of language, um, how to approach and decide on what disability coverage you're going to do. Um, and we also sponsor a uh, national, really an international contest each year uh, that recognizes the best in disability reporting around the country. Okay. Um, and, uh, and so we feel like our job is not to be an advocate particularly, but to uh, try to educate and work with journalists and communicators to help them do a better job in covering disabilities and also just making it easier for them by giving them some guidance and resources. Okay. Um, so historically, um, well, besides, the journal, besides being a journalist, I'm also an advocate, but historically um, they took out words or the medical community took out words that were not or uh, are not necessarily used anymore like um, the you know the all word uh, the word retarded um, and some other medical jargon that is not really used anymore how important is etiquette and journalism um, because this program cannot own this topic today can uh, is not only can not only be used for um, for journalists but also people that work in the field of special needs like social workers how important is etiquette um, when you're talking to someone uh, using person first language um, good question um, I, I think that all of us um, you know whether we're just talking to someone as an individual or if we're trying to reach out to an audience of some kind uh, it's important that you know who your audience is or who the person is that you're speaking to and that you speak to them with respect mm -hmm. and understanding. And that's important from, you know, from a journalistic perspective, it's really important because you want to be inclusive in your coverage. Um, there are, I mean, one out of 20 people in this country have some kind of disability, and think about all the people who know those people. I mean, it's not an insignificant number. So just from, you know, sort of a journalistic <coughs> perspective, you know, understanding and reaching your audience and reflecting your community, these are really important issues. Um, as far as what you do, uh, can you explain... Um, you know, the do's and don'ts of um, special needs or disability reporting when you're interviewing somebody? Like, can you go through some of that? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a broad area. We try very hard not to be too prescriptive. What we're trying to do <coughs> is, is provide some help and guidance. So, for example, you know, we, we tell people, you know, there are choices here, and here are just some things to think about when you make those choices. So, for example, um, you know, how, how and when do you refer to a disability at all? If you're a journalist or a communicator and you're you're writing something or producing something, mm -hmm. um, that's a that's a big question. And we tell people, you know, how, how so? How so? If you don't mind me jumping in, yeah. How, how so is that? A, can there be a problem? How so? You know, how do you deal with that? <coughs> Go ahead. What we try to mm. advise people is to refer to a disability when it's relevant mm -hmm. uh, and when the diagnosis comes from a reputable source, such as, you know, a medical professional or a licensed professional. You could run into trouble if you, you know, if, if you're relying on information about that's really a medical diagnosis and there isn't one. You can't assume that you know what the medical diagnosis is. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a journalistic question of accuracy for, for and referring to it when it's relevant. Um, w one good example, I think, is, um, you know, if uh, you're writing a story about, you know, say residents complaining about noisy airplanes flying over their houses and you interview someone who is a, uh, a resident in the area who uses a wheelchair, is it relevant to say that person uses a wheelchair in that story? And the answer to that, obviously, is probably not, because mm -hmm. using the wheelchair has nothing to do with, you know, how irritated you might be about noisy airplanes. Another example, um, I don't, I'm sure you remember this story. Well, I'm originally from New York uh, before I moved to Vermont, and um, Geraldo Rivera did a story years ago, back in the 1970s, about Willowbrook State School you know, and the problems with institutionalizing people with special needs. Many often times, people in, the, in that particular um, uh, institution were misdiagnosed. So, you know, misdiagnosed with mental retardation or something else. Um, and then Gerardo Rivera, um, along with other legislators, got that place closed because it was a problem, you know, institutionalizing people. But many often times now, um, at when the problem that I've run to as a journalist, other journalists, either when they're starting out or they, they, they have problems in their reads, um, scripts, they put the person suffers from. Yeah. Yeah, that's know. another of the language issues that we address, and yeah. we strongly discourage saying suffering from, because yeah. you don't know if that person's suffering, and they may very well not be. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a it's a very judgmental term that we recommend not using. Yeah, because I see I deal with I deal with cerebral palsy. I deal with it, but I just keep going. Yeah. But you can't assume that someone has. <clears throat> an issue without talking to the person. You know, it, uh, the person has rights, so it's person-first language. Um, as far as, um, okay, so now Cronkite School as a whole, um, uh, explain, you know, the journalism program a little bit about the students and Cronkite News and that type of thing, and, um, you know, so... Can you explain a little bit about what Cronkite School does and how it trains its students? Yeah, sure. Um, so we're a, a pretty large journalism program and, and one of the best uh, recognized in the country. Um, we have about uh, 1,700 students, mm -hmm. and um, we have programs, undergraduate and graduate programs. We're different from a lot of other journalism schools in that we really – use what we call a teaching hospital model of education, mm -hmm. which translated means it's very hands-on. Yeah. Um, we, have, we have students from their second semester freshman year mm -hmm. out reporting. Um, and so it, that's a very strong emphasis of ours. And we have something like 15 different professional programs now mm -hmm. where usually in their last semester students are 
you know, working four full days a week under the direction of a professional mm -hmm. uh, from journalism, whether so they're, they're working, they're working with a news director, they're working with um, other managers within journalism uh, to yeah. put stories together. Yeah, ab absolutely. We do a, a nightly newscast. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen Cronkite News. Yeah, I, I had gotten my training from um, uh, from Lehman College in the Bronx, and um, but you know the journalism program there, and um, the person who trained me was J.J. Gonzalez from Channel Two News. So he yeah. was my he yeah he was my professor, and um, just with my journalism, um, disability goes out the window. If you have a challenge. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, um, don't let that challenge get the best of you. And that, that's when you're interviewing somebody, and I'm sure you can agree, um, you know, it, it, the disability goes out the window, the person first. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so can you tell me, all right, so the, pro the projects, what are some of the projects that the national uh, the Association for Disability and Journalism is doing now or has done in the past? Yeah, I mentioned a little bit about our, our, our international national journalism contest recognizing disability yeah. reporting. So that's really important because, you know, you, if, if we can share and call attention to great reporting, that encourages more great reporting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, journalists sort of like contests, and they like, um, you know, some prize money. So uh, we think that's important. And then we also have our disability lang style language guide, which we've been talking about a little bit. That's probably the most used thing um, on our website. And we have just translated the guide into Spanish. Mm -hmm. It's going to be posted and distributed soon. So um, we get lots of people who come to us sort of, you know, for advice and ideas on how they should handle language issues. And there are a lot of them, and language changes quickly. So this is complicated. Uh, and, you know, journalists and communicators use the Associated Press style book. Mm -hmm. but we have more than 100 terms and words in our style book, and, you know, only about 15, 20 percent of those are even mentioned in the AP style book. So there's not a lot of guidance and direction out there. So I, as I'm looking at your website now while we're on air, um, uh, explain a little bit more about the language and style guide and why is it so important, in, you know, as far as language. You said language changes. Of course it just changes on a daily basis. So can you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, I mean, language is, you know, evolving all the time, um, and there are new phrases and words that crop up. I mean, mm -hmm. an example might be, you know, able-bodied, mm -hmm. and there's some discussion about, you know, there are people who say that that is not a good term to use because it implies that people with disabilities lack able-bodies. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, others prefer, they may prefer, you know, non-disabled or enabled as being more accurate. And so we recommend for, for in that example, using <clears throat> non-disabled or does not have a disability or is not living with a disability as more neutral choices. Mm -hmm. But sometimes journalists are going to use able-bodied, like if it's in a government report, for example. You know, handicapped parking is another example of that, where we're not saying, you know, absolutely banned, this word is banned. It's the context that you're using it in mm -hmm. um, and trying to be as inclusive and as accurate as you could possibly be. Mm -hmm. You know, there are other words that have gone out of use. You know, you mentioned the R word. Um, abnormal has gone out of use. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of these, you know, afflicted with or stricken with or suffering from or victim of. You know, those are words that have generally, and for good reason, uh, gone out of use. Well, if they've gone out of use, why is it that some journalists, um, maybe they, is it because they don't know that it's gone out of use, that, like, uh, um, suffering from why is it that some people still use it yeah you still do see it although i have to say that i see it less than i used to another example is 
you know, confined to a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. um, I still see these kinds of words and terms, but I actually, it's, it's less than it used to be. I do think this is a process of education. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it takes time, and I think we're starting to get there. Mm -hmm. Talk about, um, I noticed on your website, it says here that the, um, you know, because a lot of corporations help you, help you guys out. It says that the Ford Foundation produced a video on disability inclusion. It's important for um, inclusion and people with special needs all across the board. Can you explain a little bit about that? Because this is about uh, Judy Human. Uh, she was, yeah, um, we just she was uh, uh, she's an advocate, but go ahead. Yeah, she's a fellow at the Ford Foundation, and she's talking about, in this short video, well done video, about the um, work of the Ford, Ford Foundation with regard to disability. The, the foundation has been very active in the last just couple of years. Mm -hmm. and it's an interesting story because, you know, the Ford Foundation had been making lots of grants for all kinds of things. And disability really wasn't, um, you know, in, in their minds uh, until they got some uh, some complaints from the disability community, and it kind of woke them up. And they now are very intentional about supporting work in disability and incorporating, you know, um, disability into all of their grant programs. So they have been a big supporter of us. We got a grant from them last year, um, which ha has supporting the NCDJ operations, mm -hmm. um, and it's made a huge difference to us. Mm -hmm. um, but the, what you're referring to is what we call our news feed. So one of the things we try to do on our website is to <coughs> share news about disability. Yeah, which um, is important to get the yeah, message yeah. out there. And I noticed that Cronkite News, um, Several times I've seen other um, some of your student reporters do stories about people with special needs as well. And, yeah. And uh, can you explain um, some of that? Is some of that and how you guys um, are how you guys are working towards you know with inclusion and um, because I I'm sure that there are students with special needs within Cronkite School um, that want to be journalists. So um, can you explain? Uh, yeah. some of that as well? You know, as educators in this area, we think it's important that we teach our own students um, about how to be inclusive. And that is, so we've built a number of things into our curriculum. Mm -hmm. For example, in our multimedia journalism class where students are learning how to set up websites, um, they learn the very basic and not very difficult ways to try to make mm. um, uh, try to make a web website their websites accessible. Mm -hmm. um, if you know, doing captioning on videos is another example. Yep. Um, and um, and then in our editing classes, yes, ma'am. We have students do exercises um, on disability language and sort of edit things for you know, like confined to a wheelchair, and they have to spot that in a story and say, ah, you know, that's not really uh, what we should be doing. And they use the, our style guide for that. And um, we have a quiz that anybody can take on the site and you get a little certificate at the end if you get, <clears throat> if you do well on the language quiz. Um, and then Cronkite News you mentioned. So it, we feel like if we've introduced um, diversity and disability throughout the curriculum, by the time students get to Cronkite News, which is usually, as I said, in their senior year, sometimes a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. and they have an, a, you know, sort of an understanding and awareness mm -hmm. of disability as, um, as, a, uh, as a topic for coverage. And frankly, you know, they're, it's an undercovered topic. Mm -hmm. um, there are tons of really good stories that need to be told um, about uh, disability issues and people with disabilities. And now, now there's another there's another project. Well, besides Cronkite News, now I've noticed on on the in the um, ASU journalism that there's News Twenty One. Is that mm -hmm. is is that um, part of you guys, or is that separate from? Um, it is part of the Cronkite School. It's a, one of our uh, graduate programs. Professional programs, yeah, that I mentioned. So this program 
we bring together top journalism students from around the country with yes. our students. Yes, ma'am. Journalism students, and they uh, do really deep dive reporting on a different topic each year. Mm -hmm. So we've covered things like um, you know, uh, voting rights, mm -hmm. uh, veterans, services to veterans. I saw one. I, yeah, I saw one with, um, and it was an. I don't know if it was an older version, but I saw one where, uh, and I watched the whole entire thing about um, about water conservation. Yeah. And 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 the bad water, good water, and that's yeah. Uh, yeah. We, and we, the most uh, the most recent one we did um, uh, this past year uh, was on hate in America, hate crimes. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So those are projects that uh, are uh, we display, of course, on a website, but also share with media partners around the country. So, for example, USA Today ran. Um, one, uh, one of the, uh, uh, a couple of actually, the hate in America stories. Um, so we distribute that widely. Okay. Um, we have a little bit more time left, but um, what are your future goals with the um, National Center on Disability and Journalism and um, as a whole, as far as inclusion yeah. for, for people with special needs? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we really want to um, uh, provide more training. Mm -hmm. So sometimes that'll be in-person training. We just did one with a group of uh, Arizona State employees. Yes, ma'am. Uh, people who do websites and who do communications for the state of Arizona. And just spent um, a day with them. Uh, starting with a panel of people who live with disabilities talking about media coverage mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sort of their pet peeves and what they hope for. And then going through the style guide, uh, we talked a lot about story choices and how to try to avoid, you know, what is commonly referred to as disability porn stories. Disability um, what? Disability porn. Pornography? Wait, I'm confused. Yeah have, you, yeah, have you heard that term? No, I have not. What exactly is that? I've never heard that before. Um, the, it's, it's pretty um, commonly talked about, um, and journalists are worry about this. So it's the kind of story, okay, think about, you know, the story that you might have read or seen on television about, you know, a, um, a student who lives with a disability who gets invited to the prom. Okay. Uh, or you know, uh, the, do you find pro, do you see that as a bad thing? Well, you know, it, 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 there's there's an interesting discussion about this. I mean, um, the, on the on the negative side, people with, in, within the disability community tell us frequently that you know they don't want to be you know they're not they don't exist to inspire other people. <laughs> um, oh. And ah, I see. I see where you're going with this. Yeah, Go ahead. so it's, it's exploitive in a way. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of the conversation that we also hear from people is that, you know, well, I would rather have some of those stories than be ignored altogether. So there, there's a there's a tension there. Mm -hmm. But what we try to do is to talk to journalists about, you know, you know, think about the reason why you're doing this story and try to mainstream, which is another sort of journalistic term, people yes. with disabilities into your coverage so that you're not just talking to somebody with a disability as a, you know, um, some iconic example of something, but you know, you're doing any kind of story mm -hmm. and you want to include the voices of people with disability. So, yeah, as for example, um, <clears throat> years ago, I'm talking about like 70s and 80s, um, I was I was put in the special education for a couple of classes and then got mainstream. Mainstream people with special needs put them into inclusion classes and and make them part of society. Right. Don't don't segregate them. Is, is that the same thing as this? Yes, it's the same idea exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so um, is there anything else you would like to talk about the um, national? Uh, the National Institute of um, 
journalism and disability uh, before we end? Well, I would just encourage people to go check out our website. It's at ncdj.org. And, um, you know, we have a lot of resources there mm -hmm. uh, for anybody. And our resource, the language style guide is there. And we'll soon have the Spanish language version of that guide posted. When will that? Um... Should be in the next few days. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to thank Kristen Gilger of, of the <clears throat> National um, National Institute, uh, a National Center on Disability and Journalism, part of the Arizona State University. Um, she's the associate dean there. Thank you so much for being part of Able and On Air. Um, this puts an end to this edition of Able and On Air. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, this puts an end to this edition of Able and On Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time. <laughs>